Um, because we're going to try to have a not, we're going to try to have a not yelly kind of deal. Um, so, yeah, I'll talk about the Big Bang for a little bit. Um, I think there's a way to look at science and predict what will happen to present science um, based what's happened in the, on what's happened in the past, a kind of forensic analysis of the history of science. And I don't know if there's a name for this. Well, it's history of science, but it, nobody uses it. I don't know that anybody uses it predictively. But one thing we can pretty much guess is that the Big Bang will not be the final and best theory of the origin and structure of the universe. The two greatest theories, scientific theories in history, at least according to me, are Newton's theory of universal gravitation, which was the first theory to unite the entire universe under a single force. But the thing that holds everything together, the thing is, is gravity. That it keeps planets in their orbits. It, it, it keeps stuff stuck to the surface of the Earth. Let me ask you a question. I know, I know I'm interrupting, but I, I, when I actually have something to say about this, I want an answer. Okay. Do you know they actually said they found for the first time gravitational waves? Yeah. So what's that all about? The deal is that under general relativity, which states that the distribution of matter in the universe shapes the universe, that basically without matter, well, you wouldn't have a universe, but if you, you can picture a, a universe without matter that's flat, like a piece of paper, except in three dimensions. It's like a Wait nice a minute. Wait, how could it be flat if it doesn't have any matter? Well, it can't exist without matter. You need matter to have space. But without, it's, it's matter that deforms <coughs> space. You've seen a zillion diagrams of that where you, you have a, a sun or a black hole or a planet, and it's like you dropped a ball bearing on a rubber sheet and it put a divot in the sheet. Okay, I've seen that. All right, so if you take all the matter in the universe and you add up all the divots, they kind of pull this flat sheet around in, in a fourth dimension that we can't picture because we're not, well, we live in three dimensions. That's how we think. But uh, it kind of pulls three-dimensional space around and turns it into a spiky sphere, like a chestnut. Um, so, on, and, so matter curves space around on itself. And, so it, it, and that doesn't matter. The specifics don't matter. What matters is that matter curves space. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I just want to warn you about something. When you're, okay, when I'm painting, I have an image in my mind of the painting I'm doing. Yeah. So I can talk, but I can't imagine pictures. Yeah, that's all right, okay. So just, okay. This, this right. for the viewer, right. can imagine right. this. So, gravity is, compared to the other forces in the universe, a really gentle force. It's got, it's about one to the 10 to the 40th, one over 10 followed by 40 zeros, less powerful than like the electromagnetic force. It's, it, it ends up being a powerful force because there's no countervailing force to it. There's no way to, to limit gravity. It's always attractive. Electromagnetic force, there's attract, there are attractive and repulsive forces that cancel each other out. But gravity is always a pull force and not ever a push force, except under certain theories, but we don't have to worry about those. Um, so because it's a gentle force, it takes titan titanic events in the universe to, um, to reshape the universe in a noticeable way. If, if you drop a tennis ball to the ground, um, that the change in the position of the tennis ball versus the rest of the matter in the universe 
to, to a tiny extent, reshapes the universe. But it's probably like one over 10 to the 60th times too small, uh, an effect too small to measure by a factor of one over 10 to the 60th, or some crazy number. So the only way you can measure a, a, a change in the shape of the universe by the vibrations it creates are when you have two titanically big things crashing into each other. And that's what happens with gravitational waves. You have two black holes or neutron stars who are in a tight, which are in a tight orbit around each other and are crashing into each other, essentially, on a very short time scale. And that crash sends out gravitational waves across the universe at the speed of light. Uh, the, the speed of light is the speed at which the universe can update its information based on events happening elsewhere. It's the speed of information, not just the speed of light. So something crazy is happening in a corner of the universe. Two black holes are crashing into each other. Uh, they send out a signal in the form of distortions, teeny distortions in the shape of space. And we were able to set up a, a, a deal underground, shielded from uh, other vibrational forces where lengths actually changed by a tiny little bit based on wave, uh, based on this giant pendulum-ish rod intercepting the, uh, the waves. So that was probably a not very helpful explanation. Oh no, makes perfect sense. I always wondered why it was below the earth, but if it's below the earth, it, it can't be affected by wind and... Yeah, it like still that. can be affected, you know, trucks going by overhead, there are a bunch of experiments that need to be happen underneath the Earth. Uh, experiments with uh, um, detecting neutrinos. Um, Why is it so long? What's the, the rationale for the distance of those? Why is which so long? The underground. And also, that's what she said. <laughs> Um, I'll bet I know why, because the longer something is, the easier it is for it to move up and down with the slightest touch. Well, yeah, you need a, a big scale thing. I think it, 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 the apparatus, I, it, it may have been set up with, I don't remember the deal, but it probably had, there were probably companion apparatuses set up on the opposite side of Earth, thousands of miles away, so that yeah, that's how they did it. They basically set up a, a differences in distance from one side of the Earth to the other. You know, one side would get hit before the other side of the Earth would get hit with the wave, and they were able to detect that. But they needed the, you know, the four or 6,000 miles that these apparatuses were apart, and then to do computer analysis um, to detect the waves. 